This week, we're going to focus on two other fields of music making, those being the recording fields, a.k.a. high fidelity and studio audio art. So before we start that conversation in class, what we should talk about is audio recording history and how we even get up to these fields technologically. So just remember that we are covering the four fields of music making. Last week, we covered participatory and presentational performance. Those are the real-time fields. They're live music making experiences. And now we're focusing on high fidelity and audio, studio audio art, the recorded fields of music making. All right, so what we'll do in this video is talk about audio recording and the way the technology has developed over time and how some of those technological changes have been essential to the development of um, our recording technologies today and to the recording industry in general. So we actually start our story with Thomas Edison. And the reason for this is because Thomas Edison invented one of the first significant, not the first, but one of the first significant recording devices. So specifically what he invented was the phonograph in 1877. And essentially what this piece of technology does is that it uses this tin foil covered wax cylinder as its recording medium. And what happens is that a needle impresses little dots or grooves into the recording medium, AKA the wax cylinder. And that's actually the sound waves that are being represented and replayed back. So essentially what's happening is that it's recording the vibrations in the air, which is what sound is at its most basic level. So let me break down a little bit of what happens when this phonograph is recording and playing back. So if we look here at this graph, there's a little diaphragm in red here. This diaphragm moves back and forth, very similarly to how our eardrums receive air pressure waves, all right? And so when this diaphragm moves back and forth, it also moves this needle that's attached to it. And this needle is what embeds the dots or the sound wave vibrations into the cylinder so that can be replayed and replicated later, right? So this horn here collects all the sound and the performer has to play directly into the horn for all the sound to be collected. And it causes the diaphragm to vibrate, right? Like I said before, then the needle attached to the diaphragm moves back and forth and it etches the sound wave patterns onto the rotating cylinder the cylinder rotates as you record, so that way you're not etching onto the same spot over and over again. And what's interesting about this mode of recording is that there's no electricity at this point. It's all manual. Um, it's all um, energy produced by a person actually rotating that cylinder. And so without the electronic controls, this also means that the performer themselves, they have to make a lot of the musical adjustments, right? If they want their sound to sound softer or louder, they'll have to move closer to the horn, right? To get a, a warmer and bigger sound. And if they want to not come off as loud, let's say a trumpet player who does who wants to sound softer in the recording, they'll have to move back from the horn, which is similar to a microphone. The other thing that people who were recording could do to alter the sound of the recording is they could change the actual horn itself. So if they had a bigger horn, they re could record larger frequencies. Um, if they have a smaller horn, that could only really capture smaller frequencies. So those were the ways of mixing the sound or the record that existed. Um, there really weren't other controls that could help you out in this case. Oh, yeah. And I guess I should mention diaphragms, too. If you change the thickness of the diaphragm, that would also result in a changed sound quality. But other than that, those are really the only controls and sound manipulations possible. What we're seeing here is a picture of an acoustic recording session. If you look to the left, we can see the horn we were just talking about that's going to be connected to a phonograph of some kind or another kind of acoustic recording device. All the musicians have to play into this horn for it to be recorded accurately, 
And so one thing you should notice in this picture is that all the musicians are crammed to gather really tightly, right? Because everybody's trying to direct their sound right into the recording horn. And you can't have musicians all the way back in the room because then those sound waves won't be captured by the horn. This was a really important um, period of time because number one, all these musicians had to really nail their parts because if you messed up, uh, you'd have to do the whole recording again uh, because there was no editing individual parts. Uh, and you also had to be mindful of how much time you had in your recording. The wax cylinders and other physical recording mediums like that, that you can only record for a couple minutes or so. That's why a lot of the recordings you hear from the early 20th century are generally short because that's all they could really record onto in terms of time, right? Um, some other things you may notice in this picture uh, the loud instruments are in the back of the uh, room, right? So look at this big old uh, string instrument, look at this trombone, right? And all the brass instruments are all the way back in the room so that way they don't overpower the softer instruments like violins and, and um, woodwind instruments. So this was a way of naturally mixing the sound before we had things like mixers and sound controls. So this is essentially what I was just talking about, right? The musicians, they perform in front of this horn. Everything has to be funneled into the horn to make sure that it can, the sound waves are loud enough to move the diaphragm and the needle attached. All right, so later on, we have an improvement to this, this basic technology. Emil Berliner, he comes along with this device called the gramophone. And this device in particular uses flat shellac discs, very similar to uh, if you've ever seen a vinyl record. And these discs were important because they were a lot more durable than the wax cylinders. Uh, if you left the wax cylinders out in the sun, they could just melt. Um, they were very susceptible to damage, being chipped away, and then, of course, parts of the recording being lost. So in this case... These flat shellac discs, they enabled, number one, mass production. You could make tons of copies of these discs, copies of copies, and send them out all over the um, country or the region. So this really helped with the beginning of the music industry. And it also had longer playing times. So musicians could record for longer periods of times, make their songs a little bit longer, and that helped change the way musical forms and structures developed over time too, right? So this is a, a graph or an image of a gramophone, a very early one. Notice how this was released only 10 years after the phonograph by Edison. And so you can see where the flat disc would uh, lie here as opposed to the um, wax cylinder. As I noted before, this is what led to the birth of the recording industry, because the recording industry, one way we define that even now is the idea of mass production of music. And the gramophone, and specifically the discs, led to that type of mass production, right? And this is why the Grammys, the award show um, by the Recording Academy is called the Grammys, because this is an actual gramophone with the disc itself, and this helped birth records in the record industry. And that's what the Grammy Awards celebrates every year, is recordings. All right, so now we get into another phase of this recording history. We get into what is specifically considered the electrical recording phase. Um, and this is from 1925 to about 1945 when tape machine recording became popular, right? And so what happened is that amplification and electricity, or I should put it the other way, electricity, which led to amplification, was introduced into the recording process. And essentially by having these electronic components in in, in things like microphones um, and recording studios, you can record a lot more sensitive sounds. People don't have to play as loudly 
and as forcefully just to get all of the sound into the recording device. Now, because of the extra amplification, things like microphones start popping up that can capture the sound in a much more nuanced way. So this is essentially what's happening now. Um, instead of having a diaphragm that's the only mode of impressing sound waves onto a medium, um, what you have is still a diaphragm in this microphone that moves back and forth. But what the diaphragm does, instead of just impressing grooves into a wax cylinder or a uh, disc, it takes the sound waves, the diaphragm, and it turns them into electrical voltages, All right? So now take a look at this recording here. Now we have a microphone in the room and look how far back the musicians are. And think about that in comparison to the acoustic recording session. Um, all the mus musicians are further back. You don't have to have musicians up on high chairs and stools just to make sure the, the uh, audio gets into the cones. So this is a completely different uh, recording experience. Other things you'll notice, carpet on the floor um, and then um, curtains on the walls here too. So the microphones were just a lot more sensitive. They could pick up more nuanced sounds. And then what was always also great was that the musicians could perform longer because the playing times were longer. This led to some changes in the way that people performed music, especially in terms of vocals and instruments that were able to be played. So vocally, we start to hear crooners like Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra who are now able to intimately sing into the microphone, right? They're, they're able to sing their soft, sweet melodies because before with acoustic recording, again, think uh, gramophone and pre-electricity, the performers who were performing had to play and sing loudly. Uh, to move that diaphragm that was in the phonograph or attached to the horn. So that only that meant that back in that acoustic recording era, a lot of the singers you heard were big belters who had voices powerful enough, right, to actually move the diaphragm back and forth on the recording device. So I always the example I like to give is think about uh, you know Big Mama Thornton and and Hound Dog. You are nothing but a hound dog. Think about how loud and forcefully she was singing. And part of the reason for that is because that's the type of voice you needed to move the diaphragm. Now in the 1930s, um, with, with the invention of the electrified microphone, you can have more intimate singers, um, singers who don't have to shout. And this changes the, the style of music moving forward. Other things that change is that we start to see more um, electric based instruments. So uh, electric guitars, we start to see rising in the 1930s. And of course, this changes the way instruments were being played. Uh, if you listen to recordings from the 1920s, especially with guitar recordings, the players play so loud and it was necessary to be recorded. Frank, 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 really, really loud. Um, now in the 1930s, you can start to have... Um, I, the example I always like is blues guitarists, electro, electric blues guitarists, because they can play really delicate lines, and they don't have to worry about hitting the strings as hard. So these changes in audio history brought us to this idea of high fidelity recording. The fact that we can make recordings sound as if they were being played in real time, right? They become this type of illusion that we, we close our eyes, we listen to the recording, and, and it's almost as if the performers are right in front of us. And we'll unpack high fidelity recording more in the lecture itself, but this is just a, a way of showing you how developments in audio technology led us to this point where we could capture these illusions of live performance. Right? So see you in the lecture.